So good morning. The Biodiversity and Protected Area Management Program um, by Palmer oh, is an initiative of the African, Caribbean and Pacific Group of States and it's financed by the European Development Union, European Union's 11th European Development Fund. Um, there are two implementing partners, the IUCN, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, um, because of the global protected area and biodiversity conservation expertise, and then the Joint Research Center of the European Commission, who are based in ISPRA in Italy, for the scientific and technical expertise. So the two organizations work together to coordinate Biopalma. The overall objective of Biopalma, which runs till 2023, is to contribute to improving the long-term conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity and natural resources in protected areas and surrounding communities through better use and monitoring of information and capacity development on management and governance. So in terms of the action component, the grants all need to align with this Biopoma objective so they can be in um, protected areas or surrounding communities, the projects and activities, and very much related to the better use and monitoring of information and capacity development specifically on management and governance. But John Paul will go into a bit more detail on the action component objective. So Biopalma itself, um, the whole program covers four regions, um, the Caribbean, Central and Western Africa, Eastern and Southern Africa, and the Pacific. Seven, there are 79 countries in this, these four, four regions with more than 9,000 protected areas. Um, for the action component specifically, this is divided into six regions. So for the action component, we have the Caribbean, then Central Africa, Western Africa, Eastern Africa, Southern Africa, and the Pacific. And so there are separate um, funding pots for each of the six regions under the action component, whereas Biopalma, the program activities are just for the four regions um, as units. Just in terms of our coverage for the Eastern and Southern African Regional Office, we cover 24 countries in Eastern and Southern Africa, so 14 in Southern Africa and 10 in Eastern Africa. And that includes so from Sudan down to South Africa and the four Indian Ocean Islands of Mauritius, Madagascar, Comores, and Seychelles. For the action component, um, South Africa, because we are funded by the 11th European Development Fund, this particular fund, um, the European Commission has said that South Africa is not a developing country anymore in terms of this fund. And so South African organizations can only apply to the action component if the activities that the um, grant will be funding are outside of South Africa in one of the other African, Caribbean or Pacific countries. Um, so any transfrontier conservation projects apply. And this is a requirement from the European Union um, and nothing to do with our IUCN coverage, which does include South Africa for the actual Biopalma program activities are included under Biopalma. So just briefly, um, just to slot in where the action component fits, the overall program has regional observatories or resource hubs, which are one-stop shops um, for information on biodiversity and protected areas. Then a reference information system at a global level to bring all the data from the regional observatories. And then we have the action component, which is about activities and actions on the ground. And then across these three, we have capacity building. So capacity building related to data collection, analysis, um, reporting, and then capacity building on um, the granting system and mechanisms and the implementation. And the idea is to provide unique and tailored support to protected area authorities to address priorities for improved management and governance of biodiversity and natural resources. So you'll see as um, Jean-Paul presents, there is a you know, very close tie to the overall objectives of Biopalm and obviously the action component and what we are, would like the grants to achieve on the ground. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Jean-Paul now. Can everybody see my presentation? Yes, we can. Thanks, Jean-Paul. Okay, great. Um, so good morning, good afternoon, everybody, depending on uh, where you are joining us from. My name is Jean-Paul Mungane. I'm the Project Paipama uh, Action Components Officer, and I'm based in Kigali, Rwanda. So today, uh, I'm going to give you just a very brief overview of the Paipama Action Components for the sake of uh, those who didn't have a chance to attend the previous webinar. And I will also be taking you, you through the uh, Bioparma Action Component portal and the key element of the online application form. And I will also take you through the questionnaire for the IUCN Environment, Environment and Social Management System, uh, the logical framework, and um, there will be another session that Sue has just mentioned 
on how to prepare budget and due diligence. So starting with the overall objective of the Biopharma Action Component, uh, the main objective of the Biopharma Action Component is to improve biodiverse conservation in priority areas through funding tangible on-ground actions that address management and governance priority actions that are identified by diagnostic tools. And specifically, the Poma Action Component aims at enhancing the management and governance of protected and conserved areas in priority areas to strengthen the labor framework that is required uh, to achieve effective biodiverse conservation. Also, to support the local communities' initiatives that uh, aim at enhancing the livelihood of local people uh, while contributing to protected areas management. In total, the action component has 21 million euros that is going to be distributed uh, to the six regions uh, of the SCP countries. And there will be 3 million, uh, which will be used to supplement uh, each of these regions in case they run out of their uh, money allocated, their 3 million allocated to each region. In terms of types of grants, we have three types of grants. Uh, we have swift and technical grants, which is a small grant of up to 50,000 uh, euros uh, for a maximum duration of 12 months to be implemented at the local level. We also have small grants, uh, which will be uh, any grant between 50,000 and 100,000 for a maximum duration of one year to two years to be imp implemented at, at the local uh, level or national level. Then we also have medium grants on which we have uh, uh, kind of our current op open call for proposals, which is a grant between 100,000 and 400,000 uh, for a maximum duration of 36 months to be implemented at national and uh, regional level. Uh, just to give you uh, the key criteria for projects under the medium grants. So the maximum duration, as I just mentioned, is 36 months for any medium grant project. And they must be uh, located in priority areas. These priority areas are, for example, key biodiverse areas or any other type of protected areas with importance that uh, is justified by diagnostic tools. And this project should address priorities in terms of management and governance of, of protected and conserved areas. Uh, just to explain what we mean by diagnostic team tools, these tools include uh, management and governance assessment tools like IMET, Integrated Management Effective uh, Tool, and Protected Area Management Effective tools like uh, MET, RAPAM or Green List or any other similar tool for assessing management and governance. They also include strategic documents uh, like uh, protected area management plans or NPSAPs. They also, uh, in case these uh, two are not available, uh, other validated studies by the management authorities of protected areas can be used also to identify priorities for actions or priorities for the project under the medium grant. And from here, I just want to take you through the now the Biopharma Action Component Portal and uh, the, uh, the online application form. I'm sure I'm sure most of you are already familiar with this page. So to start uh, uh, using the online application form, you have, to, of course, first to, the first step is to log in using this button here. The, the, the page is in French now, but you can change the languages. As you can see from this button, you can uh, change the language from French to English or from English to French. And um, 
Like I said, I'm sure most of you are already familiar with this page. So to start completing your online application form, you have to log in, sign up, and then log in using this uh, button here. And uh, on this page, this is where you're going to uh, prepare and fill in the information about your project proposals. It has three different uh, sections here. Uh, the dashboard, I guess I need to change again from French to English. So it has a dash the dashboard, then ongoing application, then uh, once you have submitted your applications, they will appear under current grant. And it is under in the middle here that you will start completing your application form. So what you need to do is just to click on this big button here that is named apply for new grants. Uh, so then from here, you will be able to access the online application form which I'm going to take you through. I just, I will be highlighting just key, key uh, information or where we have been receiving uh, uh, questions so that you understand this form. So the first, uh, this application form, the online application form has uh, five different sections with uh, different steps in each of these sections. We have a technical application. We have budget, which is going to be covered by our colleague, Anna. Uh, then we have section about logical framework, the due diligence, and where you will come to submit your application. So the first section here has nine steps. There, and the first step here is to is for the overview information about your project. So key information here, like, like the title of your project, then the region um, in which you are you want to implement your project, country, priority areas. Like I said, these are, uh, for example, key biodiverse areas and other types of protected areas and conserved areas. And you also need to provide the registration number of these protected areas. I have received a great number of questions on this. Uh, this is to find the number of, of, of protected area, you need to use the World Database or on, on protected areas. So you go on that website, uh, then you enter the name of your protected area. Uh, or that, that you are targeting to find the registration number. But if you don't have, if, if your, 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 your site, the protected area of your, of your target is not available on the world database on protected areas, that's fine, you can leave this space again empty. Then again, another um, area where I have received uh, uh, questions is on the acknowledgement of receipts from the uh, uh, supervisory authority. This is a proof that you have uh, discussed or you have informed the management authority of these protected areas about your project. Then they have to give you a letter or sign that they have received uh, your information and the, 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 there is no objection. Uh, they don't have any objection uh, on, uh, on your proposed project. Then you have to upload that document um, in this field here. So other key uh, elements at this uh, step here, again, uh, you need to select which uh, Bioperma objectives. Remember, uh, your project have to address at least one or two of these uh, objectives of Bioperma action components. And you need to select one of these objectives on which uh, your project will be contributing. And you also need to specify which uh, diagnostic tools 
you have used to identify uh, your priorities for your project. Then from here next uh, is the information about your organization, about the lead applicant and the co-applicant. And you can uh, find um, further details on uh, criteria of eligibility for the different types of organizations in the guidelines, uh, which we talked about again in the uh, previous uh, webinar. So these are just details about uh, both the lead and uh, the co-applicants. Then from here next is uh, so to be able to move from one step to another at least there is uh, some information that is required so at least here I needed to select which kind of which type of organization uh, then next on step number three uh, this is where you need to describe your organization your, your experience for both the lead and the co-applicant and uh, this is going to uh, uh, to explain the experience that you have that is relevant uh, to the uh, types of activities that you are uh, proposing if you have like best uh, practices also to mention it uh, in this field here and uh, you can also you will be also be able to use this button to upload any uh, report on your latest activities of your organizations. Uh, so then, in this place here again, you use it to upload CVs of people who will be uh, implementing the project. You don't need to add uh, support staff or uh, CVs for the support staff, but uh, people who will be uh, working on the technical side of, the, of your, your project, you need to upload your CVs. Yeah. So this uh, field here is used to provide a background. It's just a summary of the local context of your uh, your targeted site or your targeted protected area or conserved area and um, from this section uh, step number five this is where you're going to provide details about your project now this is very important because this is where you're going to explain your or project uh, concept in details. And remember, this is going to be only one, uh, one step process. So you need to, to be as, as clear as possible and provide as many details as possible. Of course, you don't need to provide uh, a lot of details, but you need to provide sufficient details um, in this section because there will be no uh, many steps there will be no revision of, of your project proposal. So, um, the first section here about the problem and context analysis, this is where you describe um, the, the, and, and explain the environmental and social economic context of your project, where your project will take place. Uh, and uh, specifically on the socio-economic context, uh, uh, you need to provide um, information on the main social groups uh, that are living uh, in your project sites. For example, the, the, if, if, if that site has uh, uh, communities, local communities uh, that include indigenous people, or other ethnic groups that are vulnerable, you need to describe them. And you also need to describe their social uh, cultural characteristics and their livelihood activities to see how your project is going to uh, impact on these. 
Uh, under objectives and activities, uh, you, you need to explain how your project will contribute to the Biopama action component objectives. Uh, and oh, you, you need to really present uh, you know, clear project objectives and expected results and the main activities. And for this, uh, it's both important to use uh, the SMART method, which is uh, specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time bound. So your indicators must be specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time uh, bound. And then the method methodology is uh, where you explain the methods and the approach that you'll be using to achieve your project objectives. And this section uh, under the logic and monitoring, there is uh, under step eight and nine, you're going to fill the, mi the milestone. That's where you, st you start uh, filling your logical framework. But under this section, what is needed is um, to explain your monitoring system, how your, mini, uh, your monitoring system will work, and how um, you will be able to connect um, results from your project to the information systems uh, of the Biopharma. Under the stakeholders uh, section here, this is also very important because you need to uh, describe, uh, provide the details on how you have been engaging uh, the project stakeholders from even this stage uh, of project design, how you are involving them and how your stakeholders will be also uh, involved and what they will contribute uh, during the project implementation. This is another important section about environmental and social management. Remember, this is one of the criteria that is really very important for the uh, projects that are funded under Bioparma Action Components. Uh, you will need to complete, complete uh, this uh, environmental social management system questionnaire. Uh, and to do that, the questionnaire is just on this link. So you need to click on the link to open it and uh, I want just to just uh, take you through very quickly through this form. So this is the, the environmental and social management questionnaire that all applicants need to fill and submit as part of the application for funding. And this is also part, is, is actually, this form is also available uh, on the portal under uh, the operational manual. It's, it's annex number seven of the operational manual. And you can go back to this operational manual, uh, download it, then go into details uh, of the, this questionnaire. So I just want, want, want to show it to you. I want to uh, read in details uh, the questions here, but key points to mention here um, is that this, this, this uh, questionnaire has, uh, as you can see, has these three um, columns. The first column has questions. These are the questions that will help uh, determine where, uh, which, uh, the, whether your activities, the, uh, the activities that you're proposing are going to trigger uh, this uh, environmental and social management uh, uh, system standards of IUCN. And please uh, try to read these questions very carefully and answer them. And you'll be using uh, this, this second column to respond to this question. It's just it's yes and no questions, but you need to go through them very carefully. And the last column here, uh, you don't need to, to touch it. This is going to be used by 
the regional teams also to check what you have provided in this uh, form. So from this step, you also need to provide uh, information on the sustainability. You need to have a plan on how your project is going to be sustainable uh, beyond the project uh, timeline. And this is where this field uh, that you're going to use to present that information. You also need to explain how your project data and information uh, will be used to feed the Bioboma reference information system. And this is where you're going to uh, describe that. Complementarity and synerg uh, synergy with uh, other initiatives is also very important. So this is where you're going to do, describe uh, the, how, how your project complements with other uh, EU-funded projects, if any. And uh, the last section here about communication and visibility of your project. You also need to show your, your planned uh, uh, communication and outreach, uh, outreach uh, activities of your project. So from this step, uh, this is where actually this step number eight is very closely linked to this section about the logical framework. So if this section is not uh, filled, is not completed, you will not be able to, um, to complete your logical framework section here. So you need to fill this sec uh, section first. And um, so this is, in this field, you're going to provide the, your project duration in months. Remember, the maximum duration for the medium grants is 36 months. So you use this field to indicate your project duration. Then from here, you, in this field, you use it to uh, add your expected results. And to do that, this button, this plus button here, it will help you, you need to uh, fill this field first uh, with, um, with, with your expected results, and then select, uh, in terms of uh, project timeline, like when you are ex ex expecting to achieve the results, you add the timeline for each result here, and then the activity. So by completing this section here, you will be able to come to this section about the logical framework, then complete the, your indicators for each, of, uh, for each of your expected results. You also need to add a milestone. This is uh, like the key step uh, towards achievement of your, your expected results. And um, you can add uh, um, your milestones here, then select date. You can add as many uh, milestones as, as, as you like. And then you will be able to come to this section and complete the logical framework. So this section about the budget, is going to be explained uh, by our, our colleague Anna. I will skip this and then go directly to the logical framework. So from here, um, you can see under each result, next to each result there is indicators, column about uh, baseline, uh, uh, then, then your target and uh, the source of verifications that you have achieved your results. So the indicators are just evidence that uh, will be used to judge uh, how your expected results have been 
uh, achieved. So you will use this field to complete your indicator. Then if you, you have baseline, you also need to add your baseline, which will also include like the year. And uh, the, your, your target, we will use your target here in this column, and uh, how the sources, informations and methods that will be used um, to collect and report uh, or your, your, your expected results. Under activities as well, um, so you will have a, a certain activity in this column here, then uh, what that activity will deliver, which is a deliverable or any product, uh, expected deliverable and product, you're going to use this field to complete. And similar to the result, expected results, this field will also be used for the source of verifications. Uh, just one thing, uh, still on the logical framework, there is a whole manual on this link on how to develop a proper logical framework. So please try to go through these documents uh, to understand this concept of uh, a logical framework. The next is going to be on uh, due diligence, which is going to be covered by Anna. And I think I will end my presentation here. Um, then we can have, we, we can go to the next session. Thank you. Thanks very Hello. much, Jean-Paul. Anna, are you there? Yes, I'm there. I, okay, so we invite everyone and uh, invite is a polite word. We recommend strongly that um, these guidelines are uh, read and followed uh, while you're making your budget. So the, the first slide, <clears throat> it's just an introduction saying that your budget should be clear, transparent, comprehensive, and realistic. The assessment of your budget will be part of the assessment of your proposal. And there is a certain, certain score applied to this um, to it being transparent, efficient, economical, efficient, etc. So I would recommend to be uh, attentive to this. Next slide. Can we go to next slide? Yeah. Uh, I think we skipped one. Oh, sorry. Okay. So uh, it was explained already. Okay, <laughs> that uh, th th this is a call for that Biopharma budget is uh, based on the co-financing mechanism. It means that um, we expect at least 5% of the grant budget to be contributed by the applicants, by you. It can be contributed contributed directly by your organization, by your partners, by uh, other co-financiers. The source of this uh, co-financing is not uh, relevant to us. The minimum percentage, as was already mentioned, is 5%. So the best example, which is an example of 5%, if you are asking, for the maximum amount of 400,000. So if you want to receive 400,000, your budget should be minimum 421,052. Okay? This is how it works. Um, next slide. Can we go down? Yeah, oops, up, up a little bit. Okay, we do recommend to uh, have the sources of co-financing confirmed when you apply for the grant. Why? It's a financial risk for your organizations if 
applying for Biopharma, they don't have the confirmed sources of funding. The co-financing mechanism works in the way uh, that um, can be summarized um, very briefly. If you have um, a budget, let's say of 400,000 for simplicity, and then you report to us 400,000 and they are all good and eligible costs, then we will automatically apply 95% or a percentage agreed in the budget, in the, in the contract. But the co-financing will be demanded in any case. So in case you do not have your sources of funding confirmed, there is um, a sad prospect of loss for the organization and you need to be careful. Uh, when you work on your budget, uh, you should pay attention to the consistency of the budget with the proposed activities and the work plan. You should also think how much uh, your organization can handle in terms of finance because there is also a question of financial capacity. And uh, I would like to stress that you don't need to ask for the maximum available amount. You need to ask for a realistic amount. It's no use asking for more money, which you cannot spend afterwards. Okay, let's go down quickly. Okay, How, the, the budget should be clear because the budget will be assessed by independent experts and they need to understand uh, the budget. So it's in your interest to make it clear. For example, you don't, please do not uh, lump or group the costs together. Try to um, categorize them by natural classification. Use sequential numbering, like it is so shown here on the slide, 112, 1121, etc. If you have a partnership, if you go in a consortium, please indicate which partner is responsible for which cost. Because otherwise, it will not be clear what is the partner doing in the project if he doesn't have any costs. Okay, next. Uh, when you uh, fill in the proposal online, please make sure that you use the amounts that match the amounts in the Excel, Excel file with the budget. So if, you to if the total of your budget is 400,000, the total in the proposal should be also 400,000. That, uh, what I'm saying now, may seem quite banal, uh, but in practice, uh, we do see cases when uh, the proposal has one figure and the budget has a, a, a different figure. Uh, when you are budgeting, please include all the costs of your project. It doesn't matter who is the funder of those costs, whether it's Biopharma or you or any other co-financier. Otherwise, the budget is not correct. When preparing the budget, please do not delete the formula. They're very, very simple and nothing is blocked in the budget spreadsheet. But do not hard code the numbers, do not type them in. You see, use the formula. Then your, the odds of making a mistake, a mistake are much lower. Okay, let's go down co-financing. Okay, I, we, we, we always try to uh, be very explicit about this uh, point because it, it may potentially create uh, all kinds of uh, unpleasant uh, consequences at the end. So this pie chart shows to you how it happens. If you have 95% uh, of um, f funded by Biopharma, so a very simple budget and 5% minimum funded by someone else, all these costs will be equal for us. We do not fund particular items. You do not need to tell us, oh, our co financier will fund, uh, I don't know, the purchase of a vehicle. 
for us, what matters is the percentage of the co-financing. And all the costs of your project, independently of who funds them, they will be subject to the same rules of eligibility. They will all be subject to uh, expenditure verification in the end, uh, which, is, uh, which can be quite a thorough process. Okay, so the fact that someone else funds these five or 10 or whatever you have in terms of contribution percentage does not change the status of these costs. Okay, we are done with this one. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, this, this slide you can read uh, at your leisure because uh, here we simply explained what happens at the budget stage. And then what happens at the stage of reporting? So what can be the consequences of overspending or underspending? So this we can skip. You see, the, the, this second slide simply shows you what happens at the reporting stage and just two words. If you have underspent at the final stage and you report 400,000 instead of the budget that we signed. We apply 95%, so you receive 380,000. Now, if you have always spent, which is also possible, we will still pay the maximum amount on which we will agree in the contract. So we have two ceilings, maybe this I haven't said, and this needs to be pointed out. We have two ceilings. We have a, a fixed, uh, percentage and we have a maximum amount in absolute value. Okay, next. Um, what are in-kind contributions? We do not accept in-kind contributions. They are not uh, represent eligible costs, so please do not put them in the budget. In-kind contributions are non of financial resources. They do not create a cost. Someone makes a gift to you of a car. You cannot put this cost in the budget or in the report. This is the principle. If it doesn't create a cost in your account, this is in kind. Okay? Now, very importantly, salary costs that you can contribute are not considered in kind. They're perfectly eligible costs. Why? Because you, if you co-finance by the staff of your personnel, you incur quite real costs. You pay the salaries. So this is a perfectly eligible expenditure and can be used for co-financing. Okay, next. Direct and indirect cost. This is all quite simple. All costs need to be project specific and have to be linked to the project implementation. Now, the costs that are not linked to the project directly, that you cannot identify that they're linked directly to the project, they may be administrative, technical, logistical, they're cross cutting for the operation, they're considered to be indirect costs. Okay, next. Okay, those are the examples of indirect costs. Uh, mostly this is relevant for big organizations, uh, which share lots of uh, human resources costs, uh, legal advice costs, IT service costs across different projects. It is practically impossible to attribute these costs to a specific project. They're considered indirect. Uh, okay, next. So the, uh, we are working with the EU funding. Therefore, the maximum of flat rate that you can benefit from is 7%. You have a total of direct costs. Let's say you budget 100% uh, personnel, 100% uh, services, 100% equipment, 300 in total. Those are your direct costs, 300. You apply 7% to this, this will be your indirect cost. More is not possible. Now, you cannot either ask 
for, let's say, office rent and telephone costs when you can attribute the office rent to the project and for 7% because this will be double funding. Therefore, if, uh, and our budgets do allow this, if you want to have your office rent funded or use some utilities or other running office costs, Anna? John Paul, can you still hear Anna? Okay. Okay, uh, budget categories. There they are very clear, they are defined in the guidelines, so we don't need to spend a lot of time on them. Salaries are eligible for beneficiary and co-beneficiary. Please look at those examples. And please, uh, when you fill in the budget, be clear in the descriptions. This is uh, just an example of what can be done. Uh, in the budget advice, we, we describe what is included, what can be included in the salaries, and please include everything. Do not miss any cost. Okay, next. Uh, okay. This is an important point. You will probably, especially for big organizations, uh, have a cost share. For example, a project officer or coordinator will work with different projects or on different projects. Therefore, please indicate the percentage of time dedication, and this percentage must be reflected in the number of units, not in the unit value. So, for example, coordinator 25% over three years, which means that 12 months multiplied by three multiplied by 25, you will put nine months, but the um, salary cost for one month should not be reduced by percentages. We need to have um, the full cost, the full unit cost. Okay, next. Uh, per diems. This is important in the sense that um, you will be traveling, there will be per diems paid. You can either uh, use fixed per diems, in which case you need to have a policy, uh, or you can report with multiple receipts, which is extremely time consuming. Whichever is the case, uh, there is a link to uh, the table with EU per diem rates. Those are the maximum by country. So please uh, look at it when you are budgeting. Next. Um, okay, travel. Uh, in travel, I want just to say one thing. Uh, use of own vehicles. There are often cases when organizations use own vehicles for the project uh, implementation purposes. There must be a logbook updated regularly, uh, which shows how uh, this mileage <laughs> was recorded and uh, we also always advise to keep uh, the receipts for the purchase of fuel and uh, spare parts and other associated costs. Okay, next, um, office cost. Uh, yes, if you include it in the indirect costs, then it's zero. If you want to have it in the direct costs, then we will need to know how you did it and you will have to account for it at the end. Okay, next, other costs and services. This heading, this cost category, cost category five, is used for the costs of the third parties, 
works and services provided by third parties. So, for example, I do not imagine here any costs which are costs of the uh, beneficial organization, of your organization. Your staff time cannot be here. Your staff time is only in the cost category one. Here is when you are outsource something. Okay, next. Well, we already talked about the structure of the budget. Uh, everything needs to be clear. Uh, the descriptions, please do not put general amounts or lump sums. Uh, same about communication and visibility. Visibility activities, at any rate, they must be well described in your proposal. Uh, if you plan to uh, include in the budget seminars, events, conferences, be aware that in the justification sheet we will need a breakdown of costs, uh, which you will have anyway because this is how you do the budget. Okay, next. Okay. Uh, goods and services need to be explained in the tab or justification what procurement method you're going to apply. Uh, we have, Biopam has its own procurement policy and uh, it will be, it's, it's on the website. You will be bound by this policy. Okay, this we have already mentioned, neither leader applicant nor co-applicant can be a service provider. So you cannot be in heading five. Okay, budget units and justification, again, very quickly, because I want to talk more about simplified options. You see, there are columns, unit, which unit, by which unit you budget, number of units, units value, and total cost. Be uh, very clear what unit you base your calculations on. It is also very important for your future reporting. For example, if you budget for human resources, we recommend hours. Why? Because your time recording, your timesheets are in hours. Therefore, it makes perfect sense to budget in hours from the very start. Okay, next. Uh, well, those are examples. Vehicle rental costs would be, for example, per day. A unit for studies and work that will be subcontracted can be per contract, etc. Please make extensive use of justification sheet. Okay, next. Uh, this is an example of justification. Do not hesitate to put information here. Be clear, be explicit. It's, it's very important for the assessors to know what you put in your budget. Okay, let's go further. Uh, okay, okay. Th this is something that I wanted to uh, mention and uh, something that I want to offer to you. Uh, normally, the EU funding is based on the reimbursement of real costs. So for each euro that you spend, you report with, with the help of a supporting document, with the help of a receipt and proof of payment and proof of how it is linked to your work, et cetera, et cetera. So we all know that this is not a very, um, a very easy exercise. We are trying to pilot the application of the so-called simplified cost option. It reduces the volume of your administration. It, it will be much easier to handle for you. Uh, uh, so can we go back? Yeah. <clears throat> Couple of things. We allow this uh, simplified cost option for the category human resources, local transportation, per diems for missions travel, and office costs. So what happens at the budget stage? At the, at the budget stage, you need to be aware of this. This will be a bit more time consuming for you and for us, because we need to agree with you on a certain fixed rate. 
Okay? This rate, after you prove to us the rationality, the methodology, etc., can be approved at the budget stage and then cannot be changed. You will use this rate throughout the project, or through three years, if the project duration is three years. And, of course, at the budget stage, you need to submit the documentation for us to approve this. Uh, all the advantages will become obvious to you at the reporting stage, and you will be reporting quite frequently, depending on the type of the grant and the financial capacity of the organization. Let's go down. Okay. And there is at the, what happens at the reporting stage. And this is quite different from the option, from the usual normal practice of um, reimbursing real costs. Auditors will not check supporting documents to verify the actual costs. Auditors will check only the correct application of the method and formula for the calculation and the output. And um, in the budget template, there is a rather detailed table with a comparison. So are there any slides um, in addition to this or not? Okay, this is an example. Okay, this is a good example. If at the beginning, when you submit your budget and when, when we award your grant, you budget 12 months for a project officer uh, who costs you 2,000 euros per month, the total for this line will be approved as 24,000, okay? Then what happens when you report? There are auditors and they ask you to prove the cost. They do not question your rate. You don't have to prove the rate. The rate is fixed. But they do ask you for the time sheets because they need to know how many units, how many months in this case a person worked. So if this person worked all 12 months, no problem, you will receive 24,000. If a person worked 10 months, it will be 10 multiplied by 2,000, which is 20, which makes sense, you would agree. Okay, um, well, this is it, and if you need more information about uh, simplified cost option, then you're welcome to send us questions and we'll explain further, etc. It's, um, it's a very attractive option, I would say. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, so I see there are some questions coming in the chat and we'll also take a few questions now um, if people would like to ask them. Um, Anna, there's one. If the project is proposed for 24 to 36 months, must the co-funding also be committed for the length of the proposed project? Okay. <laughs> the co-funding is a percentage of the total amount of your costs. So you can get this co-funding uh, during months 24 to 27 or during the months 1 to 12, it's, it is not relevant for us, your funder, okay? What we always advise is you don't, you, you, it's, it's not in your interest to wait till year two or three to get the co-funding. We will be deducting it, uh, as I explained, every year starting from the very first report. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Are there any other questions? Um, you can just unmute yourself if you would like to ask a question or raise your hand. There's a, an option to raise your hand. Uh, for, uh, there is a question for human resources. You suggest we change the unit definition in the column from month to hour. Oh, you yes. can. Yes. It, it's from Laura. Uh, Alessi. Yes, you can use ours. It, in, in my practice, from what I've seen, it's much easier to work when you budget in hours. Thank you. And then, sorry, um, the, someone asked if they missed it. Can the co-funding come from an applicant? Yes, it can come from anywhere. But it should translate itself into the costs. You see? Okay. You need to spend this money. <laughs> 
Any other questions either related to the portal for Jean-Paul or for Anna related to budget and finance? Okay. Well, thank you uh, both very much. Oh, wait, there's one more kick. Could you please explain? Yeah, yeah. Mm. There is a question about Burundi, so. Oh, I did not see Burundi. Oh, sorry. Um, yes, this, we just did Eastern and Southern Africa. Um, but if you look on the portal for Western and Central Africa, for Central Africa, Burundi does for under um, Central Africa. So, sorry, this, this particular webinar is specifically for Eastern and Southern Africa, but on the portal is the list of countries for Central Africa. Okay, and uh, I see that Fidel is interested in the simpl simplified approach. Simplified approach uh, is a way to simplify your reporting, to reduce your administrative burden and hours, and to reduce your risks. It means that the rates are fixed at the budget stage, like monthly salary rate for someone, or, I don't know, office rent for a month, um, mileage. Uh, this is a very good example. In course, if you budget um, for the use of the organization's own vehicle, I don't know, 10,000 miles, then you will have to provide to us explanation why it is 10,000 miles. We all know it's an estimate, but there should be some rationale uh, behind that. And uh, in any country, there is an, an officially published rate uh, of how much is reimbursed for a mile in the official gazette. This is normally like that. And on the basis of this, we fix the rate. The rate is fixed. Then the only thing you have to prove at the reporting stage is the number of units, so the number of miles, your, your logbook, uh, and the outputs. Why did you have to travel? So it becomes a much easier exercise than reporting with all those innumerable receipts. Thanks, Anna. Okay. Um, there is one, which email um, should we give Jean-Paul's, or are you happy to take queries on budget as well, Anna? Uh, let's address this, let's discuss it afterwards, because we will need to do it consistently for all regions. Okay, so I'll just put Jean-Paul for now and then he can redirect them to yeah. you as needed. Okay, and then there is another one there um, from Laura. Can you see it? Yes, there? Laura. Yes, Laura. This is correct. This is only needed. This list of supporting documents are only needed if you want your rate to be fixed. If you are happy with um, the real cost option, like a regular EU uh, approach, methodology, then we won't be asking you to prove uh, the cost of someone. Simplified cost option is, is a choice, is a choice you make. But it is also our decision because you, you need to prove that you are, that we are agreeing on something which is realistic, reasonable, um, you know, and, and real, that you are not, we are not in, inventing things. Also, one thing that is important to understand about simplified cost option, it can result also in, in, it, it can go both ways. It can result in a profit to you, or it can result in a loss if you underestimate the rate, okay? If you need to plan for three years and you are, you are conscious of the inflationary situation in the country, this can also be taken into account, the inflation rate. So this is also possible. Highly recommended. <laughs> Thanks. So as Anna said, it is a lot more work um, in the beginning, but then over the next three years, your workload is much less as opposed to the other option, which is easier in the beginning, but then a lot more work over the three years. Any other questions? Um, I put John Paul's email in there and between him and myself, we will also try and answer what we can or redirect to Anna as needed. Um, please also note the frequently asked questions on the action component portal. 
um, because if we do get lots of questions related to certain um, issues, we, they will be put up there as well. Um, and then there's another one, how do we know if the methodology we use for um, simplified cost will be accepted? Um, well, the methodology is very simple and it is described uh, in the table. You describe to us, we need a project officer, he must have this and this qualification and he costs, uh, we have a similar position that costs now so much. Uh, this makes total sense, right? Uh, you know, this methodology makes sense or we need to cover so much so many miles during the project if it makes sense then it is accepted but uh, the methodology is one thing we will also ask for the supporting documents if you say that uh, your organization has a similar position similar function on its payroll now and it costs I don't know 2,000 euros we will ask for a couple of pay slips a contract, etc., to see that this does exist. So, uh, uh, I mean, this approach is quite, I would say, practical. It's it's a very pragmatic approach. Thanks, Anna. Any other questions? Otherwise, what we'll do is wrap up. And please do get in touch if you have any other queries. And the webinar will be loaded onto the Biopharma um, YouTube channel, and we will share the link as well. But thank you all very much. One more. If we use the Simplicast method, do we need still budget 12.5K for the audit? Yes. Well, um, this amount is, uh, for the moment, it's, it's not confirmed yet. But the audit will uh, happen for all the uh, medium grants. But it will be a different audit. Well, I mean, what I mean to say is that the expenditure verification, it's not an audit, it's an expenditure verification. The expenditure verification for the actually incurred costs is quite different from the expenditure verification for a simplified cost option. Okay, the, the budgeted amount still remains. Thank you very much, Anna and Jean-Paul, and thank you all for joining, and um, all the best with all your um, proposals. We look forward to receiving them. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Bye.